Hi, I'm Robert Coleman. I'm a Senior Applications Manager at Texas Instruments. Welcome to PowerCoats. Hi, welcome to Power Tip 44. In this Power Tip, we will discuss power systems with large low transients and large low transient change rates. Here is a possible processor transient load requirement you might see. Here are the things that are important to the processor. It wants a, a stable input voltage of, say, one volt. It may draw as much as 20 amps, and it may go from needing no current at all to needing that full 20 amps in a very short time period. And uh, typically at the power supply, you may see a change in your load current of that 20 amps in less than a microsecond. Many times the processor people bandy around the transient requirement of 100 amps per microsecond. And they want the power supply to maintain the voltage on their processor to within 30 millivolts during that time. So here's an interesting bit of math over on the right. We started with the old equation E equals L di dt and used some of these values from our table to do a quick calculation. So we did a calculation of determining the allowable inductance between the power supply and the load for these requirements. So the inductance is equal to 30 millivolt change divided by the 100 amps per microsecond or the allowable inductance between the power supply and the load is 0.3 nanohenries. So what is 0.3 nanohenries? 0.3 nanohenries is one centimeter of a very wide trace over a ground plane, or three bond wires done properly. When I say properly, that means that the ground and the source are kind of interleaved. And this reduces some of the mutual inductance in the path. Um, a VIA has 0.3 nanohenries. That's pretty impressive that a VIA is all we're allowed to have in the way of inductance between the power supply and the, and the load here. And then the last thing, what really needs to be done in these systems is there needs to be a very well done set of capacitors that go along with the load. And you can get down to this 0.3 nanohenries with six parallel 1210 capacitors if you do it properly. And so when I say properly, that means that you have to be aware of the parasitics. Uh, parasitic inductances can diminish the parallel caps filtering ability. Here in this chart, I've plotted impedance of a couple of different things versus frequency. The first one is a single capacitor on a circuit board over a ground plane. And I've varied the frequency, measured the, the impedance of the capacitor, and at low frequency, the capacitor behaves exactly like it should. It looks like a capacitance, impedance goes down versus frequency. And it continues to go down to a point. And this point is established by the equivalent series inductance of the capacitor. At this particular point on the curve, the inductance and the capacitance have resonated and all you're seeing is the ESR of the capacitor. And then once you get past the resonance, you start to see only the, the series inductance of the capacitor and the impedance starts to go up. Now, in the second case, I've taken a second capacitor and added it to my first capacitor. They're both over a ground plane, nice short runs between the two capacitors. And you see at low frequency, we have a 6 dB or 2 to 1 variation in our impedance, and that's what we expect. But as we approach resonance, we've seen that the resonance has shifted. And resonance has shifted lower, meaning that there's a little bit more inductance in series with those capacitors than we expected. That means that you can't just take the self-inductance of a capacitor and divide by 2 for 2 in parallel. You have to be aware that there's some mutual inductance between the capacitors and then there is some hookup inductance between the two capacitors. And so that gives you the shift that we're seeing here. Here's an interesting slide. Um, the size and the shape of a capacitor impact the series inductance. What we've seen here is in this column we have the size of the capacitor. Uh, 603 is a capacitor that, that's 60 mils long and 30 mils across. and the dimensions follow, follow the, the numbers all the way up here. And the first thing that we see looking at this table is 
603 resistor has about 0.6 nanohenries of inductance. 805, which is a slightly longer capacitor, has a slightly larger amount of inductance. And it, it's pretty well related to the length of the inductor. The next thing, as we go down this table here, is that we see that we've changed the termination locations on this capacitor. Rather than have the current flow the long path down the capacitor, we've turned it the other direction to the short path down the And so we've shortened up our, our current flow path by about a factor of two here. And then the second thing we did was increase the width of the capacitor. And so that allowed us to reduce the inductance of the capacitor also. So you can see that we've gone from a relatively high 0.8 nanohenries inductance with 805 capacitor down to 0.2 nanohenries of inductance with the 0508 capacitor. And you can see that as we go down the, the table here, you can see that the inductance increases as we go higher in length. And then if we go to the short direction on the capacitor, we can see that we get the same kind of reduction that we did previously with the 805. So to summarize, the longer the capacitor, the more inductance it has. The wider the capacitor, the less inductance it has. And you can impact the inductance of a capacitor by four to one, depending on how you terminate the electrodes. Also, I did some simulations of power systems with these low transient requirements in them. And I, I constructed a pretty simple little piece by model. In my piece spice model, I, I have a load that's fixed, and I also have a load resistance that's open and closed into the circuit, and that allows me to generate the large change in current. I have a load capacitance that I modeled that, that included a, a ESR in the capacitor, and then also I had a little interconnect inductance between the load and the bypasses and the power supply, and I varied that pretty significantly. Uh, in one case, we start with zero nanohenries of interconnect inductance, and then we varied it up to as much as 500 nanohenries of interconnect inductance. And so those are the extreme cases. One would represent the power supply co-located with the load, and then the second case might be a power supply that's been cabled to the load or has a relatively long run across a motherboard. For the power supply, I did a, a very simple model also. Here are the output filter capacitors, my power supply, along with the ESR the, of those capacitors. And then I modeled my power supply as a current mode controlled power supply. So I have a simple voltage controlled current source driving my output filter capacitor and, and load. And then I measured the output voltage here and taken it to my air amplifier. Again, I did a very simple model for the air amplifier. I had a voltage controlled voltage source and then just simple feedback. And this is a type two compensation that you would typically see with current mode control. And so I used that previous model to generate this table. And basically what, what you're going to try to decide when you're putting together your power system for these types of load is do I want to co-locate my power supply with the load? Um, do I want the power supply to be able to operate without the load? And then the final question is, how much inductance do I have between the, the power supply and the load? And so this is a, a very big decision. And what I have done here is presented the three different cases. The, the first one is zero, internet, zero interconnect inductance and the zero represents the co-located power supply. The five nanohenries represents a power supply that might be a, a brick that you would stick on your circuit board located very closely to the load. And then the final one is one that we were talking about earlier, which might be cabled in or might be across the way from your particular load. And so in the first set of simulations, I was able to run the system with zero power supply capacitances and required all my capacitance to be at the, at the load. But basically, since there was zero interconnect inductance, that allowed me to eliminate this capacitor. 
And then I was able to use a relatively small amount of capacitance, uh, one millifarad capacitance for our 30 millivolt variation for a 20 amp step. And so that's a pretty s small amount of capacitance. In the second case, I required the power supply to be able to operate standalone. And so that meant that the loop had to be stable with or without a load. And then, so what happens then is I have to provide some capacitance on the power supply to be able to stabilize the loop. And so I did a little study of where the capacitance did the most good. And there, there was maybe a half a millifarad of capacitance required at the load before it got into, into the interconnect inductance, and then one millifarad at the load. And so what you've seen is we've impacted the cost of the power system because we required 50% more capacitance in the power system because of that small amount of internet inductance. Remember, we were trying to get 0 0.3 nanohenries inductance between the power supply and the load, and since we weren't able to do that, it required us to put some bypass capacitance at the load. And this is the extreme case here, where we have half a microhenry of inductance. And that requires a significant amount of capacitance at the load, and it also re requires a significant amount of capacitance because you have to be able to operate your power supply without this load capacitance and have it stable with both just 20 millifarads of capacitance connected to the power supply as well as 70 millifarads of capacitance connected to the power supply. So th this is a key decision. You know, the first decision is do you buy a brick and put some capacitance at your load? Uh, do you co-locate your power supply with your load or are you going to cable in and have a significant cost penalty in capacitors? The other thing that the standalone power supply adds is slow response. Not only does it significantly impact the cost of the power system, you can see in this curve here where we compared a integrated or co-located power supply to the response of a power system that has been cabled in. And so in this case, we have very small amount of capacitance at, at the load, no interconnect inductance, very rapid transient response in the power supply. In this case, we look at the time scale and we see that we still have transients going on two milliseconds after they started. So if you had repeated transients that maybe it occurred here, you have significant voltage deviation from this type of approach. So in summary, processor power people brag a lot about their high DIDTs. Uh, typically you'll be throwing requirements of 100 amps per microsecond or even higher than that, maybe even 1,000 amps per microsecond. And what you're going to find is that by the time they get to the power supply, they're usually a lot lower. Now that's because the processor people are going to put many bypass capacitors around their load and then there's going to be some interconnect inductance between these bypass capacitors and, and the power supply. As we saw in that previous chart, you can significantly impact the cost of your power system if you don't control the interconnect inductance. It needs to be minimized and some of the ways that you can do it, you can put parallel paths for your current to flow, you can build over your ground planes, and then you can use low inductance components. And that means sometimes small components, that means considering alternate terminations on your capacitors. If you consider the whole power system, rather than focusing on a power supply specification, you are going to produce the highest performance and lowest cost design. So the last decision that you have to make is do you want that power supply to be able to operate standalone or can it operate into a fixed load such as a bank of capacitors? There's a lot of convenience to be said for having a power supply that you can test without the, the load capacitance, but there's a lot of cost that goes along with it also. And the cost can get pretty significant if the internet inductance is not minimized. Uh, as we saw in the chart, our requirements for bypassing between the power supply and the load were impacted 70 to 1 with a bad choice on the internet inductance. So thanks for your attention.
For more power tips, visit Power Management Design Line and search for power tips, or you can click on the link to all articles in the description section of this video. Thanks for listening.